Today on Ortho 2, we are going to be talking about Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon was a genus of non-mammalian synapsids that lived during the early Permian. Often called a dinosaur by the public, it is far from it. This strange animal was actually more closely related to mammals. They were the top predators of their time and show us a glimpse into a much more ancient Earth. Before we talk about how amazing this animal was, let's talk about its evolution first. Dimetrodon belongs to the clade Synapsida. Synapsids are a group of animals that include mammals and every animal more closely related to mammals than to other members of the amniote clade, such as reptiles and birds. They are separated from other amniotes by having a temporal fenestra, an opening in the skull behind each eye. Synapsids have one of these holes. All mammals are synapsids. Dinosaurs are diapsids along with lizards, birds, turtles, and snakes. Because of this and other characteristics, we know that Dimetrodon and other synapsids from the time are the ancestors of mammals. But they were not mammals. True mammals would not appear until much later, around 210 million years ago. Dimetrodon and its closest relatives are often called pelicosaurs, though this is now an informal grouping. It actually belongs to the family Sphenicodontidae. This family appeared at the very end of the Carboniferous. They were unique for possessing long, deep, and narrow skulls. This was an adaptation for strong jaw muscles. They also had large, dagger-like front teeth, while the teeth on the sides of their mouths are much smaller. This trait would go on to be one of the most important in what makes mammals so effective. Most reptiles have uniform teeth, while mammals usually have four distinct types. Sphenicodontids' teeth were still relatively uniform in shape, but their size certainly differed. Pair this with a strong bite and there's no wonder why they are the apex predators of their time. Several Sphenicodontids had sails on their backs, but many did not. Some of the sails were much more tame, like the sail on Sphenicodon. Others like Secodontosaurus and of course Dimetrodon had very large sails. These animals were very advanced for their time. I say advanced in quotations because this word should be used with caution in regards to paleontology. Animals are only advanced in relativity to their contemporaries, and what is considered advanced is subjective in itself, but this group had traits that made it a pioneer for its time. Dimetrodon itself was a very unique Sphenicodontid. There are 13 species of Dimetrodon, though at one point there were 20 because of misidentifications. Most Dimetrodon species range in length from 1.7 to 4.6 meters or 6 to 15 feet. They are estimated to have weighed between 28 to 250 kilograms or 60 to 550 pounds. The largest known species of Dimetrodon is Dimetrodon angelensis. Angelensis was a species that weighed up to 250 kilograms or 550 pounds. Even in modern times, a predator weighing this much is massive. That is larger than a lion, about the size of the biggest tigers, and a little less than the average grizzly. Some Dimetrodon species would have been among the largest predators of the early Permian. Many species of Dimetrodon were much smaller though. The smallest species, D. teutonis, was 60 centimeters or 24 inches in length, about the size of a house cat. The skull of Dimetrodon is fascinating. It is tall and compressed laterally. The eye sockets are positioned high and far back in the skull. Behind each eye is a fairly large infratemporal fenestra. The tip of the upper jaw is raised to accompany the opposing tip of the lower jaw. This feature is very unique and usually seen in animals that feed on slippery fish. Spinosaurus had sort of a similar jaw, but does that mean Dimetrodon was feeding on fish? Well, actually sort of. Researchers found that Dimetrodon may have actually fed on aquatic resources even more than terrestrial plant eaters. A fossil site that contained 39 Dimetrodons also contained the dismembered corpses of 88 Diplocolis. Diplocolis was a boomerang-headed amphibian that was about a foot long. Buried among the chewed up bones were dozens of Dimetrodon teeth. Pair this evidence with a skull shape and it seems that Dimetrodon was adapted to catching slippery prey. 
but its story is more complicated than that. Its skull was very heavily built. In comparison, dinosaur skulls were thinner to lighten up the skull and provide attachment points for muscle. Overall, its skull was just so robust. Something about it being just solid bone doesn't look right. When you compare it to a dinosaur or to a mammal, the skull almost looks fake. It would have definitely been an intimidating beast in life, and its bite backed it up. The size of the teeth varies greatly along the length of the jaws, lending Dimetrodon its name, which means two measure of tooth, in reference to the sets of small and large teeth. One or two pairs of caniniforms extend from the maxilla. Large incisor teeth are also present at the tips of the upper and lower jaws, rooted in the premaxilla and dentary bones. Small teeth are present around the maxillary step and behind the caniniforms, becoming smaller further back in the jaw. Many teeth are widest at their midsections and narrow closer to their jaws, giving them an appearance of a teardrop. Teardrop-shaped teeth are unique to Dimetrodon and other closely related sphenicodontids, and help distinguish them from other early synapsids. As in many other early synapsids, the teeth of most Dimetrodon species are serrated at their edges. The serrations of Dimetrodon teeth were so fine that they resembled tiny cracks. The dinosaur Albertosaurus had similar crack-like serrations. A 2014 study showed that Dimetrodon was in an arms race against its prey. The smaller species did not have the serrations since it only ate small prey. The prey grew larger and several Dimetrodon species started developing serrations on their teeth and increasing in size. D. limbatus had enamel serrations that helped to cut through flesh. The second largest species, D. grandis, had denticle serrations similar to that of sharks and theropod dinosaurs, making its teeth even more specialized for slicing through flesh. This study demonstrates that as Dimetrodon's prey grew larger, the various species responded by evolving into larger sizes and developing even sharper teeth. How amazing is it that we can study biology and evolution of creatures so long dead? Dimetrodon had ridges on the inner surface of the nasal section called nasoturbinals. They may have supported cartilage that increased the area of the olfactory epithylum, the layer of tissue that detects odors. These ridges are much smaller than those of later synapsids from the late Permian and Triassic, whose large nasoturbinals are taken as evidence for warm-bloodedness because they may have supported mucous membranes that warmed and moistened the incoming air. The nasal cavity of Dimetrodon is transitional between those of early land vertebrates and mammals. The rest of Dimetrodon's body is just as amazing as the skull. It was originally depicted as a sluggish animal that would drag its belly around with sprawling lizard-like legs. It was found that it had more of an upright posture. How much so, we don't exactly know. It had similar dimensions to that of a caiman, a crocodilian that can hold its legs vertically enough to raise its body off the ground. Trackways from the Permian have shown that it did not drag its belly or tail on the ground as it walked. It was not as upright as, let's say, a dog, but certainly didn't run like a lizard. I think some reconstructions exaggerate just how upright it was, but I guess the animal could have stood more upright if it was trying to be intimidating or maybe just to go faster. Interestingly, its hind legs and hips were much more sloped down than its upper body. Still, its tail was held mostly off the ground except for maybe the tip. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Its giant sail. Sails are actually not all that rare throughout the history of life. Even some modern lizards and fish have sails, but the size of Dimetrodon's sail is baffling. Dimetrodon's world was actually full of sails. Not only did other pelicosaurs have sails, but even some temnospondyl amphibians had them. The purpose of Dimetrodon's sail has been debated for years. The main theories are sexual display, thermoregulation, and a bison-like fatty hump. Thermoregulation is a popular answer. The sail with its large surface area could be used to warm up the body in the early morning sun. It could also be faced in the direction of the wind or be dunked in the water to cool the animal off. 
This argument is bolstered by the presence of contemporary sailback taxa living in similarly hot, arid environments. Spinosaurus, Oranosaurus, and Amargosaurus all lived in the early Cretaceous of Gondwana. They were also sailed back animals in the hot Middle Triassic. Getting rid of heat is a major issue, especially for big animals in hot environments. The fact that other sailed back animals also lived in hot environments gives merit to this theory. Though it seems to make sense, there has been little empirical verification for it. Hawk extensively tested the sails of three different species of Dimetrodon using thermodynamic equations. He found that the sail did heat up the body, but the larger factor was the overall body size. Cooling was also tested, but proved even less effective. Hawk concluded that either the small change in temperature was enough of an advantage, or that these structures served a different purpose. I should know that there is also criticism saying that he was too conservative with his estimates. Even if thermoregulation wasn't its main function, assuming the sail had a decent amount of blood flow, then the sail could still be used to heat the body as well as any other function. In recent years, the thermoregulation theory has become less popular. The other main theory is that the sail was used for sexual display. Some of the strangest structures we see in modern animals are as a result of sexual display. All four modern sail-backed lizard groups show sexual dimorphism in their sail growth. Males have larger sails while females have smaller or no sails at all. This is not directly analogous to pelicosaurs, but it is interesting. It is at least one example of sails being used for sexual display. It does make sense. Such a large showy structure could be used for mating rituals or even to determine dominance. Dimetrodon likely still retained four color cones which would have allowed it to be more sensitive to the nuances of other Dimetrodon colors. It is possible they could have even controlled the color of their sail like a chameleon, but this is just purely speculation. The sail itself was unique in structure. The spines were thin and relatively flimsy. It is very unlikely that they supported any muscular or fat hump besides maybe at the very base would have likely been connected by skin and a thin amount of flesh. We think this because we often find spines that have been broken and regrown back in weird ways. With just thin skin holding the spine in place, the spine would lean to one side after being broken and heal in a weird orientation. It should be noted as well that the very tips of the spine stuck out beyond the sail. A while ago, a misinterpretation of a paper caused a lot of people to think that it had some sort of half sail, but this is not true. Another less talked about function the sail may have played was to aid in locomotion. The sail strengthened the back and allowed for better side to side movement. Overall, the sail is a very strange feature and likely evolved for mainly sexual display, but thermoregulation could have also played a role. We may never really know the purpose of this sail exactly, but a lot of animals from the time had sails. Dimetrodons may have been sexually dimorphic. Evidence comes in the form of individuals with thicker bones, bigger sails, and more pronounced step on their jaw. Sex is hard to definitely tell in fossil specimens and remains a mystery if they were really sexually dimorphic. Another thing people often get wrong about this animal is depicting it as a scaly lizard. No fossil evidence of Dimetrodon skin has been found, yet the skin impression of a related Estaminosuchus tells us that they may have had smooth, gland-filled skin. Estaminosuchus is a little distant to make direct comparisons, but it is basically a fact that it was not covered in scales, at least on much of its body. Interestingly, it did have large scutes on the underside of its tail and belly. Since we know that these groups are the ancestors of mammals, there's been a lot of speculation about it having some sort of primitive hair or fur. This is purely speculation at this point, but it is not too out of the ordinary. It is unclear when fur originated in synapsids, and as you can imagine, hair and fur do not really fossilize well. It may have had very rudimentary or sparse hair, maybe on the face as a primitive form of whiskers. Fossils of Dimetrodon are known across the United States and Germany areas that were part of the supercontinent Euro-America during the early Permian. 
Dimetrodon is often depicted in a barren, desert-like environment. Though this is not entirely inaccurate, it was most common in wetlands. Most fossil finds are part of the lowland ecosystems which, during the Permian, would have been vast wetlands. In particular, the red beds of Texas is an area of great diversity of fossil tetrapods. Its environment was full of large amphibians like the aforementioned Diplocolis, and others like Archeria and Uriops. It also contained Reptilia morpha like Samoya and reptiles like Captorhinus. This ecosystem was obviously very dependent on water, with a large amount of the tetrapods being amphibians. Aquatic plants were the primary producers and were fed upon by fish and aquatic invertebrates. The land vertebrates mainly fed on these primary consumers and terrestrial invertebrates. Dimetrodon was probably the top predator of the red beds ecosystem. It fed on a variety of organisms such as the shark Xenacanthus and the aquatic amphibians and terrestrial tetrapods of its time. Like mentioned previously, terrestrial tetrapods seem to be consumed less often. Dimetrodon would have spent most of its life near water. Its environment was akin to the Florida Everglades. Though it is easy to imagine it as a croc-like animal, its anatomy suggests it would have hunted mainly on land or very shallow water. The red bed's assemblage also includes some of the first large land-living herbivores like Edaphosaurus. Feeding primarily on terrestrial plants, these herbivores did not derive their energy from the aquatic food webs. Dimetrodon may have preyed on this large animal, but likely not very often. The ecosystems of the red beds is fascinating. A lush and warm environment full of biodiversity. If you look up why Dimetrodon went extinct, a surprising number of people state that it died out in the end Permian mass extinction. This is simply not true. Dimetrodon went extinct 272 million years ago. That is 21 million years before the Great Dying. So then what happened to it? It died out in Olson's extinction. An extinction that I am sure many of you have never heard of. There is no widely accepted theory for the cause of Olson's extinction, and it is a fairly new realization that there was a mass extinction at this time. Climate change is a typical culprit. What we do know is that there was a global drop in biodiversity and major consequences for land tetrapods. After Olson's extinction, the world was now run by therapsids. Life did not recover from this event until after the Great Dying. Perhaps getting hit with a mass extinction only 20 million years prior is what made the Great Dying, well, so great. Dimetrodon was a fascinating animal. Once thought of a scaly, lumbering lizard, but now known as a strange mammal-like synapsid. It seems there may be a lot more discoveries to make of this animal, and I am excited to say the least. Thanks for watching, and I hope you liked the video. I have plenty of other videos like this, and I am also on Instagram where I talk to fans all the time. Go check that out, link in the description. I'll see you in the next episode of Northo 2. See ya.